Dear Patriots, before the news starts, please, subscribe to our patriotic channel by clicking the subscribe button. Give us a thumbs up to this video. Don't forget to leave your opinion below in the comments section. Share the news on Facebook and Twitter so you friends see it. Thank you. White House pushes Trump's commitment to gun rights after President meets top NRA lobbyist. President Donald Trump remains committed to defending Americans' Second Amendment rights, White House Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders said in a brief exchange with reporters Friday morning that followed hours after the president met with NRA leaders. Sanders' Friday morning emphasis on gun rights marked another volley in the back and forth between Trump who has voiced support for certain gun control measures in the wake of a mass shooting at a Florida high school last month, and Second Amendment advocates, among them the NRA and members of his own party, who have continued to oppose such steps. Trump's embrace of certain gun control measures has been met with raised eyebrows both from liberals skeptical of the president's sincerity and from conservatives confused by his divergence from the NRA which endorsed him during the 2016 and has been among his most consistent backers. At a White House meeting on Wednesday, Trump chided GOP lawmakers for being afraid of the NRA and undercut gun rights advocates by suggesting that the government ought to skirt due process rules take guns away those suspected of posing a public safety risk. But since that meeting with lawmakers, rhetoric from the White House has erred closer to that of Second Amendment advocates. Trump wrote on Twitter Thursday night that he had a good, great, meeting in the Oval Office tonight with the NRA. Chris Cox, chief lobbyist for the Institute for Legislative Action, which is the NRA's lobbying arm, wrote on Twitter that the NRA and Trump want to keep schools safe and to keep guns away from dangerous people. I had a great meeting tonight with that real Donald Trump and at VP. We all want safe schools mental health reform and to keep guns away from dangerous people. POTUS and POTUS support the Second Amendment, support strong due process and don't want gun control. Hashtag NRA hashtag MAGA Cox wrote on Twitter. Sanders on Friday reiterated that the president continues to be a strong advocate of the right to bear arms. He'll continue to support the Second Amendment, that's not something that he's backed away from. Sanders told reporters when asked if the president had made any promises to the NRA during his White House meeting on Thursday with the group's leadership. The background check system is something that he's still very much interested in improving. The press secretary said the president would not necessarily support universal background checks for all gun purchases but does support legislation sponsored by Senators John Cornyn, Republican Texas, and Chris Murphy, Democrat Connecticut that would strengthen the background check system. She said Trump still supports raising the age at which certain guns can be purchased to 21, but conceded that there's not a lot of broad support for that. Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer, DNY, in a statement emailed to reporters Friday, urged the president to stick to the gun control positions he outlined on Wednesday. President Trump should go with his instincts, not the clarion and destructive call of the NRA. He knows instinctively that this is the right thing to do both substantively, because it will save tens of thousands of lives, and politically because over three-quarters of the American people support it, Schumer said in his statement. If he continues to bow to his right-wing ringmasters, we will get nothing done on guns and his presidency will continue to fail. Trump After Dark Still the Show Edition. It was a day of tumult, at home, abroad, within the Republican Party and inside the White House itself. Another day in the presidency of Donald Trump. Trump's decision to enact steep tariffs on steel and aluminum rocked financial markets and drew criticism from home and abroad, Politico's Doug Palmer reports. It had European diplomats and members of Trump's own party howling. It also may have etched Gary Cohn. Trump's top economic aide, toward the exit. Cohn has forcefully opposed the new tariffs, and he may now join departing White House Communications Director Hope Hicks in departing. Other staff exits are rumored. The Steele decision came as Republicans were still recoiling from another abrupt Trump policy lurch on guns. 
His apparent embrace of gun control measures has sent Congress scrambling, Politico's Ilana Shore reports. It's also had congressional conservatives scrambling, many of them are staunch backers of the president and were caught off guard by Trump's abrupt embrace of gun control, Politico's Burgess Everett and Rachel Bade report. Trump threw decades of party orthodoxy on gun rights out the window, as he mused aloud about enacting a comprehensive gun control package and said due process should come after guns are taken away from dangerous people. The response, among congressional Republicans was a mix of disbelief, denial and outrage. Elsewhere in President Trump's orbit HR problem? After NBC News reported, citing numerous sources, that White House National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster was on his way out, a White House aide said Trump dismissed that talk as fake news. Intel fight, the top Republican and Democrat on the Senate Intelligence Committee met with House Speaker Paul Ryan to complain about leaks about Warner from the House Intelligence Committee. Changing environment, after receiving scrutiny for numerous first-class flights as the administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency. Scott Pruitt now says he'll fly coach. Putin down a marker, Russian President Vladimir Putin says Russia has developed a way to deliver a nuclear weapon that cannot be stopped by U.S. missile defenses or anyone else. New envoy, the U.S. ambassador to Mexico, Roberta Jacobson, is stepping down. The Mexican government says it's approved the Trump administration's choice to replace her, although that choice hasn't yet been announced. Drastic action. President Trump suggested using the death penalty for drug dealers as a way to crack down the opioid epidemic. Trouble Bruin, The New York Times reports that Treasury Secretary Steve Nutchen blocked UCLA from releasing video of him being heckled repeatedly by students after a lecture there this week. There you have it. You're caught up on the Trump administration. Digit. Trump ignored bright line on discussing Russia with Hicks. President Donald Trump's lawyers have urged him not to discuss details of the unfolding Russia investigation with anyone outside his legal team, warning of a conversational bright line that could put aides and associates in legal jeopardy, according to current and former Trump aides. But Trump often ignores that legal advice in the presence of senior aides, including his departing confidant and White House communications director, Hope Hicks. I think the president has put her in a very precarious position, a senior Trump administration official said in a recent interview. Hicks is not alone. Current and former Trump aides describe a president who often fails to observe boundaries about the Russia probe and who calls staffers into his office and raises the subject without warning. Hicks in particular, Trump told her, could be on both sides of the, bright, line. As one of his longest-serving and most trusted aides, Hicks may have been subjected to an unwelcome amount of legally relevant comments from the president. Speaking freely about an ongoing investigation is a major mistake, say veteran defense attorneys with White House experience. Every defense lawyer will advise his client don't talk to people about the facts of the case. But when you work for the president and the president is not only constantly talking, but tweeting, I'm sure that's doubly difficult, said William Jeffress, a Washington attorney who represented former President Richard M. Nixon after his resignation and I. Lewis Scooter Libby, former senior aide under President George W. Bush. That concept is not lost on White House officials. People are afraid to talk to each other, Anthony Scaramucci, who served a very brief stint as White House communications director before Hicks, told CNN on Thursday. But there is little they can do about a president both consumed with allegations against him and resistant to advice about what subjects he should avoid discussing. The problem is especially acute for Hicks and other aides subjected to Trump's spending, given special counsel Robert Mueller's known interest in whether Trump has sought to obstruct justice from within the White House. Hicks' exit from the White House in the coming weeks will hardly immunize her from legal headaches but it will spare her from learning more things on the inside that could potentially lead to a second or third visit to the special counsel's office and higher legal bills, as one former Trump aide put it. The former Trump aide, who experienced firsthand the lack of discipline in the president's discussions about Russia matters, 
said the situation stemmed in part from the unique nature of a White House that runs on personal access and loyalty. Part of the problem in this White House is you have, every day, people who engage in matters concerning this investigation, the source said. That is problematic, because not only does it distract from the work that taxpayers are paying them to do, but it also, in certain instances, can make them witnesses or potentially targets of the investigation. That's really dangerous. A nightmare scenario for a White House staffer might resemble the saga of Betty Curry, a personal secretary to President Bill Clinton. Amid an investigation into his affair with Monica Lewinsky, Clinton had a private 1998 conversation with Curry about her memories of his contacts with the White House in turn, a talk that prosecutors suspected was an effort at illegal witness manipulation. Curry denied that Clinton had coached her, but later said that, despite my telling them over and over and over again, they didn't believe me. Hicks, by virtue of her longtime close relationship with Trump, has already become a significant figure in the multiple probes into Russian election meddling and alleged Kremlin influence over Trump's campaign. She met in December with special counsel Robert Mueller and spent nearly nine hours testifying before the House Intelligence Committee on Tuesday. Hicks also has appeared before the Senate Intelligence Committee. Hicks is known to have been present or involved in several key episodes of interest to federal Russia investigators. Mueller has questioned her about a meeting on Air Force One as Trump returned from a July trip to Europe, in which Trump, his aides and family members crafted a misleading statement about a June 2016 Trump Tower meeting organized by his son, Donald Trump Jr., with a Russian lawyer offering dirt on Hillary Clinton. She was also with Trump in March 2016 when he first announced that Carter Page and George Papadopoulos were joining his campaign's foreign policy team. Both men have since become focal points of the current Mueller and congressional investigations. Hicks was on email chains involving Page as he ran an invitation to speak in Moscow up the campaign's chain of command. She fielded media inquiries for Paul Manafort, who at the time served as campaign chairman, about his ties to Oleg Deripaska, a Russian aluminum magnate and ally to Russian President Vladimir Putin. Serving in Trump's White House inner circle also meant Hicks was with the president in Bedminster, New Jersey, during an early May 2017 weekend when he decided to fire FBI Director James Comey, a move that triggered Mueller's investigation and has put Trump under the special counsel's scrutiny for potential obstruction of justice. The Washington Post reported last fall that Hicks was also with the president in the Oval Office a day before Comey's ouster, during a discussion about a letter drafted by aide Stephen Miller that spelled out the president's reasons for firing the FBI chief. She was the only Trump aide present during a July interview Trump gave the New York Times in which he described his anger that Attorney General Jeff Sessions had recused himself from the Russia probe, another potential component of an obstruction of justice case. White House aides and a friend of Hicks on Wednesday insisted her departure isn't connected solely to the Russia probe, noting it had been under discussion for weeks. She'll be incredibly difficult to replace, said White House attorney Ty Cobb, who has been serving as the official point man for the president's response to the Russia probe. She couldn't have been a more supportive or talented ally to me. Still, the timing of her exit announcement, the day after her House testimony, during which she reportedly acknowledged telling small lies to cover for the president, stirred suspicion. Even after she surrenders her White House badge, Hicks might not be finished speaking to federal investigators. Former senior White House aides Ryan Priebus, Steve Bannon and Sean Spicer have all met with Mueller's team since their White House departures. And Mark Corallo, a former spokesman for Trump's legal team, met with Mueller last month. It's so easy to get caught up in these things, even if you have nothing substantive to do with decisions," said Adam Goldberg, a Bill Clinton White House lawyer who handled crisis communications during the Monica Lewinsky scandal. Just being on a phone call, even if you might disagree with everyone, that's a one-way ticket to the grand jury," Goldberg added.